here to start module three of the hand in hand training, being with a person with dementia, listening and speaking to a person with dementia. So let's talk about being with somebody with dementia. It means that you're understanding things from their perspective. Have, are you used to doing that? Or are you used to kind of having this task list and doing it and, oh yeah, they have dementia, but you're not really <coughs> seeing things from their perspective. That's kind of what we get into sometimes. And to be quite honest with you, I'm not sure that we will ever change how we do things in long-term care for dementia elders until we turn that around. I think we will just always stay in this little um, pattern that we're in, that we have tasks. And until we turn it around and look at it from their perspective, we will not be able to change that. It's about being with them where they are. Did you hear me? Being with them where they are. It's about recognizing them as whole and unique individuals. Even in end-stage dementia. Have you had anybody in end-stage dementia? Mm -hmm. Where they, they cannot speak anymore. Sometimes you have to feed them. Or you have to, uh, you would literally put the food into their mouth. They still have abilities. You know, we have senses. We have smell, we have taste, we have touch, we have sight, we have hearing, we have pain. All of those things. We have senses, and a person in end-stage dementia has all of those things. They can still smell. They can still hear, usually, unless aging has affected their hearing. They can still see. They can still feel you touch. We have to start focusing on their abilities, not their disabilities. We have to see that they really are still the person that's in there. We have to build on their strengths and we have to connect with them. So the objectives is that you will be able to explain why persons with dementia have unique communication needs. Have you noticed that? Mm -hmm. It's not like going in and saying, can you rate your pain one to 10? And they'll say six. And so you give them a, what, it, what do you give for pain here? Narco. Oh. <laughs> went to Schedule 2 That's this week. That's the biggest week. one. I'm, yeah, went to Schedule 2 time. this week. That's mm -hmm. a scary thing, huh? Anyway, it's they can't do that. They can't tell you that. They can't think through that. You're going to identify strategies for communicating with persons with dementia. You're going to recognize the impact of your interactions with the person with dementia, you every interaction that you have makes an impact on them. Do you think that? When you're talking to someone with dementia, are you remembering that this is impacting them? This is impacting their life today, their quality of life. Every interaction that you have, it's no longer just a task list. And it's you will be able to understand how to look for the meaning in the verbal and nonverbal communication of persons with dementia. This is in review. Dementia is not a disease itself. It's a group of symptoms. There are reversible and irreversible kinds of dementia. And it is the most, the most common irreversible is Alzheimer's disease. We've already talked about that. It, Alzheimer's disease is the fifth leading cause of death in the United States right now. In the top 10, it is the only one that's rising. So cancer and heart disease and stroke and diabetes and lung issues, we're getting a handle on all of those. Alzheimer's is just going up, just going up. So remember the symptoms of dementia are memory, concentration, orientation, language, judgment, visual spatial skills, and sequencing. So let's talk a little bit about why dementia changes communication. 
the goal of this lesson is that the changes in the brain, remember the pictures of the brain, and this one over here had the holes, the big hole in it, and it was smaller. The changes in the brain of a person with dementia cause communication changes. If you have diabetes, the cells in your pancreas are changed. If you have colon cancer, the cells in your colon are changed. If you have lung disease, the cells in the, in the lung are changed. We're good at treating those, aren't we? We're good at giving medication and adding oxygen and giving them insulin and controlling their diet and all of those things, but we don't get dementia. We don't understand how to take care of somebody that has dementia. Okay, so, oh, so we have, see the pictures again. Normal, mild, somebody with pretty advanced Alzheimer's disease. The brain actually changes. So here we, we're talking about memory. The frontal lobe is involved in memory. The hypothalamus plays a role in making new memories. Are your folks very good at that, making new memories? Not very. That's sort of involved in short-term memory. And the hypothalamus is here in this big black space. Temporal lobe is memory. It's also impulse control, things like that. The frontal lobe is involved in speech. The temporal lobe is involved with language. They get affected by types of dementia. The frontal lobe is involved in concentration and orientation. You see what's happened to it? It's black. The occipital and parietal lobes are about visual spatial. The brain is affected. The cells are different. The frontal lobe is involved in judgment. The cerebellum is involved in sequencing. You know, when we problem solve, we sequence. First, the first step of problem solving is identifying there's a problem. Your elders with dementia are really good at identifying there's some problem, there's something wrong. The second step is determining the source. Your elders with dementia are not good at that at all. The third step is developing a, some sort of um, solution. How's that working out for you? People with dementia don't come up with good solutions and then the fourth step is actually implementing that solution and that doesn't work out at all for us. Well, I can get up and walk to the bathroom. I don't need to call for help. I have no idea what that thing is that, that they're saying is a walker. I don't even know what that is. So I don't need that. I've never had that before. So they walk off without the walker and then what happens? They fall. Especially if you've given them Respiradol or Zyprexa or Ativan even. We have to do what we can to fill in for their deficits. Remember, actually I will tell you, I don't give a rip what they can't do anymore. I don't care what they can't do, but I do care what they can do. And I care that we are all the time focusing on what they still can do. Let's talk about wandering. What can a person, you have anybody with a care plan that talks about wandering? Mm -hmm. We have, have had. You have had. Okay. So when they wander, that you have that under a problem list, right? Wandering. Yeah. What can they do if they wander? Walk. They can walk. Do you want them to stop walking? Yeah. No. But we put that in a problem list. Okay. So dementia affects communication. In this lesson, you have learned that changes actually occur to the brain of a person with dementia. This is not something they choose to do. These behaviors that you, the wandering, is not something they choose to do. Their brain doesn't work anymore. And how the brain changes that can affect communication. So let's talk about communicating with somebody with dementia. The goals of this lesson are to understand that verbal and nonverbal forms of communication might take persons with dementia. They might, you're going to have to use both. 
okay? You will have, you can use the verbal, remember that 20 second delay that we talked about earlier? There is a 20, there can be up to a 20 second delay between, between the time you say something and the time they process it. 20 seconds is a long time. Mm -hmm. So if you say, pick up the fish stick, take a bite of the fish stick. But how would it be if you would say, here is your fish stick, can you take a bite of it? And they would pick it up. There will still be a delay, but they do it themselves. Which is faster, you feed them the fish stick, or they eat the fish stick? Feeding. Faster. Yeah, feeding is faster. Mm -hmm. What's the better way? Letting them, do it. Letting them do it. You don't want them to stop eating, do you? Let's talk a little bit about uh, communication. Remember I told you short-term memory is your weakest, long-term memory is your strongest. Are you using alarms? Mm -hmm. Do they sound? Verbal? Yes. They, they, they sound. You can hear it. Audibly sound, hear them. Yes. What would we do? What would we do if the alarm would go off in here today? Right now. What would we do? React to them. Yeah, what would we do? I'm oh, we would get up, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. All their lives, when they heard an alarm, they got up. Now, you want them to sit down when they hear it, right? Mm -hmm. They can't do it. They can't do it. Their brain is affected. They can't. That's associated with their long-term procedural memory. They can't do that. Alarms are not fall prevention devices. Mm -hmm. they, they are fall alerts, mm -hmm. but they are not fall prevention devices. It, I, I, don't, I would venture to say that an alarm never stopped. Now, people will argue with me, but they very seldom stop a fall. But they do alert you that a fall perhaps has happened. Okay, so in your dining room, do you ever hear sit down sit down, you need to sit down. Mm -hmm. Why? Do you at your home, not in your home-like setting, but in your home, do you ever eat while you're walking around? Yeah, I stand up a lot of times. Really? The but when they come here, they have to sit down, right? Mm -hmm. So do you have a home or an institution? It's a trick question. <laughs> <laughs> so they have to sit down to eat here. Is that what you just told me? Yeah. yeah. I don't understand why. Because I would promise you that you can give every sort of food in finger food. Other than liquid, ice cream, that kind of thing. Well, even ice cream. Other than liquid soups, things like that, you can put in a two-handled cup, right? There isn't another food that you cannot make finger food. Somebody tell me one. I've done about 45 dementia trainings, and nobody's been able to tell me one any. So tell me, Paco, tell me what is a food that you, <laughs> you knew I was going to call on you, right? What's a food that you can't give in finger food? Oatmeal? No, you can put oatmeal between toast and have an oatmeal sandwich. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. It has to be what? thick. It, you can't add the milk and then... Yeah. How about cottage cheese? Cottage cheese you can put between crackers. You can even put between two pieces of tomato. A lot of people eat tomato and cottage mm -hmm. cheese together mm -hmm. and they can pick that up and eat it. I think a lot of that just goes against people's moral code because you know their culture you sit down and you eat but so we don't all the time right but that's what you're you know always taught is that we have dinner at the dinner table you know it's when you're younger you were taught yes. you know it's impolite to you know you don't get up five times while you're right. eating you right and you well and we so, wouldn't have a problem with it in our house if I knew the person wasn't a fall risk and they weren't going to choke they right. 
Now, I didn't say they might not need assistance or supervision. I just said that they don't have to sit down to eat. That there are other ways. If they want to get up, if somebody were telling you all the time, sit down, sit down, you need to sit down, are you going to eat? No. No, it's going to make you angry, isn't it? It's going to just pretty soon frustrate the heck out of you. And you're apt to just try and hit the person because you're trying to tell me what to do and I want to get up. They get to do that. We need to go to where they are. Go to where they are. Don't make them come to where you are. They can't do it. Remember the pictures of the brains. They can't do it. It's morning. Time to get up. Rise and shine. What? Oh, good morning. Good morning. So you need to sit up, swing your feet around, and then stand up. Let me help you. Come on. Oh. Thank you. I need my, uh, I can't find. You can't my... find what? I can't find my... Miss Caputo, what? I... Is it your robe? No. Do you need to use the bathroom? No. Your glasses. That's it, right? You what? need your glasses? Oh. oh, no. Oh, no. Did they break? So what do you want to wear today? Your daughter Sue's coming to visit. So maybe you want to wear that nice blouse she bought you for your birthday? What do you think? What do you think, Ms. Caputo? Uh, I, I, I think I like, good. I like good. that. I'll set out your toothbrush, and then you can brush your teeth when you're done, okay? Okay. And just put those on when you get done, okay? Okay. I'll be back in a minute. I, I, don't, I don't know. I, what? You're still not dressed? Come on, Miss Caputo. I just need you to brush your teeth and get dressed so when your daughters get here, you're ready. My daughter, my daughters are coming? One daughter, just one. Susan, she's bringing your granddaughter. No, you do not know. I have four little ones. Yes, or I do know. You four. tell me every day, a lot. But right now, there's one daughter on her way to come see you. So could you please just brush your teeth and get dressed? No, they are not coming. Yes, Miss Caputo, they are. I'll be back. Get dressed. exactly what I would have done. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so what did you notice about her commute about Mrs. Caputo's communication? She was very confused. Mm -hmm. Very confused. Mm -hmm. How many steps could she do? Did you hear the steps that she gave her? Oh, Put so your feet out. Yeah, mm -hmm. she did. The the caregiver just I think there were three or four steps that she gave she her. She didn't give her time to wake up who goes in and wake exactly. someone that's yeah. How do you like that? Time to get up. Time to get up. <laughs> You're sleeping. I mean, how is that's that's a bad way to wake up, isn't it? Pretty much starts everything on a bad foot. Yeah. Anything else you saw? What did you notice about the caregivers' communication? She was annoying. She was very harsh. She talked fast. She was very harsh. No patience. None that I could see. Anything else you could see? She wasn't giving clear directions, and it wasn't laid out correctly. It right. was, hurry up, your daughter's coming, I'll be back. It wasn't, let me help you, what do you need help with today? Not enough yeah. time to process it? Mm -hmm. No, not, remember the 20 second delay. Mm -hmm. By the time Mrs. Caputo processed the first thing, 
the caregiver was on to about six down the list. Mm -hmm. How about, so how did Mrs. Caputo react? Back to bed, pulled the covers up. I'd want to restart that day too. Me too. Me too. Was it abnormal behavior? No. But my guess is if I went to the care plan for Mrs. Caputo, I would see that she's resistant to cares. What do you think? Yeah. She didn't do what the caregiver said. And so then you get documentation that she's resistant to care. So what happened? She went back to bed. Me too. Good morning, Ms. Caputo. May I come in? It's Heather. Good morning, Ms. Caputo. It's Heather. May I come in? Good morning. Good morning, Ms. Caputo. Good morning. It's Heather. Are you ready to get up? Okay. Okay? Mm -hmm. All right. Would you like for me to help you? No. There you go. Swing your legs over to me. There you go. Mm. You ready? Mm. All right, here you go. One, two, three. <laughs> Good. Thank you. You're welcome. <sighs> you okay? I, I need my... Uh... It's okay, take I, your time. I, I, I can't find... Uh... Your robe? No. You want no, your robe? No, I can't find my... Uh... Oh, I know what it is. Your glasses. What? You, oh! It's okay. They're fine. Did I break them? Mm, they're just fine. See? Let me clean them for you. Here we are. There you go. Right as rain. Uh -huh. <laughs> just, there you are. Very good. Now, do you need to use the restroom? Huh? Do you need to use the restroom? No. Okay. No. What do you say we pick out some clothes to wear today? Okay. All right. Your daughter is coming today. Susan, would you like to wear the shirt she got you for your birthday? Uh -huh. Or your favorite blouse? Oh. Oh. It's okay. Take your time, Miss Caputo. We are in no rush. I this think... is when Susan got you for your birthday. I like that. This one? I like that. Okay. Good choice. Now, here are your undergarments and, mm. of course, your purse. Mm. There we go. Now, Miss Caputo, let's get dressed before Susan comes to take you out. Susan? Yes, before your daughter Susan oh, comes daughter's? to... Are my daughters all right? Oh, they're fine, Miss Caputo. They're great. They're just fine. I hear you are going out to a very special lunch. Uh -huh. I think you're going out for tacos. Oh. Oh, yes. And maybe you'll have some chocolate cake, too. Ooh. <laughs> Let's go. Oh, Miss Caputo. Let's put your clothes on first. Oh. We got to put some clothes on. That would be good. <laughs> yes, just let's take your nightgown off. Okay. There you are. Very good. Mm, I can smell breakfast now, too. It smells like pancakes. Uh -huh. <laughs> can you smell the pancakes? Yeah. Oh, yeah. They smell good. Uh -huh. All right. Okay. I think you're going to have a lot of fun today. Big difference, huh? Mm -hmm. uh -huh. So what did you notice about Mrs. Caputo's communication on this one? It was more clear. Yep. She actually communicated better, didn't she? Right. Mm -hmm. And what did you notice about the caregivers, Heather's? She um, was patient. She was patient. She was kind. Calm. Calm. Mm -hmm. One know. step directions. Mm -hmm. And she not only verbally communicated, but she gestured and communicated too. So, so she used some non-verbal communication. Glasses on. 
she opened the bathroom door mm -hmm. and showed her what was in there. Yeah. So how did Mrs. Caputo react this time? Very well. Yeah, she did. And she was starting to get dressed, right? Mm -hmm. So which com which scenario took longer? The second one. The first one took longer. Because she was, because the uh, she wasn't getting ready. She was confused. The second one, she did step by step, so the process was going faster. We think that the second one took longer. I would venture to challenge you that perhaps it took less time to do it slowly and right the first the first time than to have to come back in and back in and back in and then finally probably do it for her because you're in a hurry, mm -hmm. right? I think one of the barriers that I hear about quick dementia care frequently is that, well, we don't have time. Well, we need, would need more staff for this. I am going to challenge you that you don't have time not to do this because it may take a little longer for each one, each interaction, but it's going to be done with each interaction. It's not going to have to be repeated. Well, and her behavior won't end there at the room. If she's brought out to the dining room after being gotten up like that, mm -hmm. yep. Then you're going to have some, you can just anticipate, the get out, the the, that's right, the rest of the day is going to go poorly. Her time, which is precious with her family, is not going to be as good if she's had this kind of start to her day. Mm -hmm. Because she won't remember the frustrations in the first incident, but there will be something wrong mm -hmm. all day long. Because have being anxious actually it changes you physiologically. Endorphins and hormones are uh, put through you, not endorphins, but hormones are put through your body in a response, in a reactive response that you don't recover from quickly. Good morning, Ms. Caputo. May I come in? It's Heather. Good morning, Ms. Caputo. It's Heather. May I come in? Good morning. Good morning, Ms. Caputo. Good morning. It's Heather. Are you ready to get up? Okay. Okay? Mm -hmm. All right. Would you like for me to help you? No. There you go. Swing your legs over to me. There you go. Mm. You ready? Mm. All right, here you go. One, two, three. <laughs> Good. Thank you. You're welcome. <sighs> you okay? I, I need my... Uh, it's okay, take I, your time. I, I, I can't find... Uh, your robe? No. You want no, your robe? No, I can't find my. Uh... Oh, I know what it is. Your glasses. What? You... Oh! It's okay. They're fine. Did I break them? Mm, they're just fine. See? Let me clean them for you. Here we are. There you go. Right as rain. Uh -huh. <laughs> just... There you are. Very good. Now, do you need to use the restroom? Huh? Do you need to use the restroom? No. Okay. No. What do you say we pick out some clothes to wear today? Okay. All right. Your daughter is coming today. Susan, would you like to wear the shirt she got you for your birthday? Uh -huh. Or your favorite blouse? Oh. It's okay. Take your time, Miss Caputo. We are in no rush. I this is one Susan got you for your birthday. I think I like that. This one? I like that. Okay. Good choice. Now, here are your undergarments. And 
Mm. Of course, your purse. Mm. There we go. Now, Miss Caputo, let's get dressed before Susan comes to take you out. Susan? Yes, before your daughter Susan oh, comes daughters? to... Are my daughters all right? Oh, they're fine, Miss Caputo. They're great. They're just fine. I hear you are going out to a very special lunch. Uh -huh. I think you're going out for tacos. Oh. Oh, yes. And maybe you'll have some chocolate cake, too. Ooh. ooh. <laughs> Let's go. Oh, Miss Caputo. Let's put your clothes on first. Oh. We got to put some clothes on. <laughs> that would be good. Yes, just let's take your nightgown off. Okay. There you are. Very good. Mm, I can smell breakfast now, too. It smells like pancakes. <laughs> <laughs> can you smell the pancakes? Yeah. Oh, yeah. They smell good. <laughs> All right. Okay. I think you're going to have a lot of fun today. What she, what Heather knew about Mrs. Caputo. What was, let's start with Jane, the first caregiver. What did Jane know about Mrs. Caputo? She needed step by step instructions. Yep, she knew that. Anything else that she knew? She needed physical help putting the stuff out of the mm -hmm. I think she knew that Mrs. Caputo was going to take a while to get ready. She was trying to rush her. Mm -hmm. So she knew things that had to be done, right? What did Heather know about Mrs. Caputo that helped with the situation? She just went ahead and made gestures for her, like putting her glasses on. She just did it and so that Mrs. Caputo followed. Yeah. What else? She, she knew, knew that she had four daughters. She knew about her family. Who, her, which daughter was. Mm -hmm. She also knew what they were going to do, what they were going to do to plan for the day. Yeah. What else? She knew that she enjoyed pancakes. Pancakes. What else? She knew it took her time to process. Yep. Actually. She also knew she likes chocolate cake. And she knew she liked tacos, right? Mm -hmm. And she knew which daughter had given Mrs. Caputo that blouse. I actually thought she was encouraging Mrs. Caputo to choose that one, mm -hmm. but she didn't. So, so do you see the difference between knowing needs and knowing something about her? There's a huge difference, isn't there? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we have to get to know. Now, there's risks with that. Nursing facilities are not places to go to die. But sometimes death happens. And that's hard on you all, isn't it? It's like our family member died. We have to get prepared for that. We have to support ourselves. We have to take care of ourselves so that we're able to deal with all of those things. Okay, so some things that she did. She identified herself. She used the elder's preferred name. Where would we find that? In the care plan. How many of you have read the care plans for everybody that you care for? Especially with a new patient. What's the point of the care plan? So everybody knows. It's, it's the instruction manual for taking care of the elder. Paco, should you read the care plan? Yes. Absolutely. Do you? Uh, not always. Okay. Thank you for being honest. If you have not read the instruction manual for how to take care of somebody, then I don't know how you would possibly know how to take care of somebody. And the care plan that you read must be bigger than your little jot sheet or your cardex or whatever you call it in your facility. It has to include those important things for she likes chocolate cake. She likes pancakes. She can smell. Because she said to her, can you smell the pancakes? Yeah. She can smell. Would that be something that would be good to know? Yeah, it would be. Mm -hmm. Okay. Eye level, make eye contact, sit down with them. I don't know for sure about putting your knee on the floor. I have to think about that a little. That's something you need to decide. Listen. Give them your full attention. Pay attention to your body language. Are you hurrying them or are you actually caring for the elder? 
Use visual and verbal cues, observe their body language, speak slowly, and use short, simple sentences. Don't give them three or four or five steps to do. Be patient. Anybody ever have to be patient with you all? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Really? Then you need to be patient with the people that you're caring for. Give them time, be specific, ask one question at a time, give one step directions, repeat your questions with patience and love in your voice, ask them how you can help. She'll be able to tell you. Tell them what you're doing. <laughs> time to get up, time to get up. No, no. Reassure them with touch. Reassure them. Did you feel very reassured right no. then? No. Reassure them with your touch. Touch is one of the most important things we do, is touching our elders with love and compassion. In fact, there is something called compassionate touch. Um, look for their feelings. Laugh. You laugh much here? Yes. I hope so. I hope so. Avoid negative words. Don't argue. Do not argue with them. I've been asked just to share a couple of basic tools for better communication with you. And I think this is so important. I think that most of the experience of a person living with dementia in any care environment really comes down to those little moments that they have with each person they interact with. And those moments can be good or bad, but that creates a, a sort of a subconscious memory of what a person has through the day, which really contributes to or detracts from their overall well-being. So I spend a lot of time talking about communication. And the first thing I say is when you approach a person, particularly if you're entering their room, I always tell people to not first identify yourself and ask permission to come inside. One of the causes of free-floating anxiety in nursing homes is the fact that people don't have any space that truly is theirs. We tend to treat the, the home and the rooms as our workplace rather than a person's home. And we often come and go without permission. We talk about people with dementia who do intrusive wandering. We intrusively wander in nursing homes all the time, going in out of people's rooms to get medication, to get them out of bed, to uh, put laundry in their drawers, and we never ask permission. So give people a space they control and ask permission to come in and speak with them. And then greet people, particularly at the beginning of the day. Ask them how they're doing. And the next thing is really to listen to what people say. Studies have shown that over 90% of the communication in nursing homes is from staff to elders rather than a real dialogue. And then the next important thing I ask people to do is to sit down. And I know this is a tough sell for staff who are busy doing things that require a lot of standing over the bed or over a chair. But the truth is that sitting down is a powerful thing. It does three things. First of all, it puts you face to face so that you can be seen better, you can be heard better. It facilitates good communication. The second thing is it puts you on equal level with the person you're talking to. No matter how kind you are, if you're standing over somebody, there's this impression of dominating or controlling them that you can't get rid of. And people who uh, live with dementia often are more attuned to our body language. And so they may see this as someone who is trying to control them or who is threatening to them. By getting at eye level or even slightly below eye level, you put yourself on equal ground. The third reason to sit down is because it gives another very important unspoken message, and that is, I have time for you. And I tell people that I'm as crazy as anybody else. When I go to see people, I'm rushing around, I'm reading the charts quickly, but when I go in the room, I try to create this mental place where I say, I don't care what I just did or where I'm going an hour from now, I am here right now and I'm going to be present in the moment. Because what we find is a lot of people who we think can't communicate are just not with a person who is present and who is receptive to them. And so they shut down. When you are present for somebody and when you give them that unspoken message that you are there to attend to their needs, all of a sudden people are able to communicate better than they are in most care environments. Dr. Al Powers wrote a book called Dementia Without Drugs. He's now written another book, and I'm sorry, I don't know the name of that book, but Dr. Powers believes that we give dementia care not rotely from the med pass, but we really care when we, get, we take care of people with dementia. So what does it mean to you to be present? To be attentive to 
kids and be focusing on them as well and not who, whose call light's going off right now, whose room you just came out of, just focusing on them in the present time. That's right. This goes for every interaction we have. I hope that I, I have two other sons. One of those uh, sons has a great difficulty visiting because they're always on the cell phone. They're looking at the at the texts and they're looking at, and it makes you feel like you're not valued. You know, that happens in other interactions in our life. To be present means that you're actually paying attention. You're actually caring about them. So tell me some ways that you've tried to be present for your elders. I do sometimes get down on my knees next to them and listen to them Good. when I'm asking them a question. I know you said something about getting on your knees, so I haven't done that. The only <laughs> reason I would caution you about that is infection control. Yeah. So you might want to just pull a chair up. Mm -hmm. A lot I'm being of very interested in or being interested and engaged in what they're talking about. Yes. What they're conversating about. My guess is that there is some truth, some memory that means something to them in every interaction they have with you. Right. A lot of the residents, because I go resident to resident every day, making sure they're doing okay and they've got what they need, a lot of them just want to talk. You know, they see all the people who are so busy during the day, which they understand, but it's nice to just have somebody who's like, what's going on today? I just want to talk to you. And so they'll just sit there and they just want you to pull up a chair and talk to them for a little bit, get that interaction. Yeah, because you're there for the purpose of talking to them. Mm -hmm. You don't want, to want them to do anything. You don't want to do anything to them or you don't want them to do anything to you. And so you have the opportunity to just be there and talk to them. Yep. Talk about, talk to me about choices. Your folks get choices? Yes. Like? All the time. Meal, time. Meal, meal time. They can come whenever they want to. What time they get up? What time they get up. What You're not gonna go in and yeah. shake them. What? what time what time they go to bed. They can go to bed when they want to go to bed. Mm -hmm. Great. When they get their showers. When they get their showers, or they can have a shower or a tub. You have, I was yeah. in this spa room here, it's beautiful. You can have a tub bath. What well, they can watch or do. Activities. Well, activities of their interests. Mm -hmm. Good. Good. Clothes. Clothes. Good. Good. All of those are important because when we don't have control of our lives anymore, none, somebody is telling you what to do, where to be, what, who to talk to all the time, we don't have much quality then. Okay, so in this lesson we've learned about verbal and nonverbal forms of communication, how we can communicate well with a person with dementia, and how we can impact our conversation on the lives of the, of the elders. So, we're going to listen to this real quick. Hello, I have some important information for you about our next exercise. First, you should know, if you ever need to flood your harness, then the best way to do it is to get open the windows and wheels up. I know many of you know that already, but if you stew it into say, well, mock our life freezing. Next. You need to never, ever, ever do what I just said. Okay, she gave her a blank and put what you have in your head down on the table. Then write this. And there you have it. I really appreciate your time. Thank you. So, how did you feel? Confused. Confused. Didn't have any idea what she was talking about, did you? Mm -hmm. At the, uh, there is an opportunity called the Virtual Dementia Tour. And you have a, about a 10 minute opportunity to have dementia. If you ever get an opportunity to do that, I would strongly encourage you to do that. 
you put headphones on, you put un very uncomfortable um, things in your shoes so that you kind spikes. of have some idea. What? It's the spikes. So plastic stuff you put on your chair, mm -hmm. they flip it, cut it out. Those spikes that go, go into the carpet. Yes. Oh, mm -hmm. go on your hands and your feet. Yes. And there is noise going on all the time. When you are in mid to end stage dementia, the cognitive visual field, not what you can see, but what you can pay attention to, is 14 inches. The rest is all just environmental stuff. It all just jumbles up into sound. Sound that doesn't make any sense. 14 inches is pretty close, isn't it? So sit down, sit down, you need to sit down, yelling across the room. I'm not paying no attention to you. <laughs> because they can't, they can't. Because you're outside of what they can pay attention to. You have to know where the person is and be in that place with them. Okay, so to practice looking for the meaning behind the words when, they're when you are communicating, you must know what they are trying to tell you. So we learned about looking for the meaning behind the words when communicating with people with dementia. So in this module, we have learned their, their unique, very special communication needs. It's because they have dementia, because they aren't making all that much sense to you, does not mean that what they are saying doesn't mean something to them. And we have to figure out what that is. Strategies for communicating, we had all those lists of things that we can do. The impact of your communications. Did you see how Mrs. Caputo, the difference between her reaction to those two forms of communication? And then we need to know how to look for the meaning. Any questions, comments about communicating with somebody with dementia? Okay, we have finished module three.